Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Cheng Wang from FlexLogic, who's going to talk today about inferencing chips and what's changed over the past couple of years. So Cheng, when we first started talking about inferencing chips, we started looking at this in terms of this is going to be the way forward for AI, but one inference chip is not the same as another, right? Absolutely not. Yeah. In the end of the day, it all depends on your end application and what constraints do you have? Are you just trying to go for the maximum performance? In most times, edge AI, they're not. Or are you trying to satisfy certain costs or power or form factor constraints? And you'll see in edge AI, that's actually a very, very important factor. Actually, in many cases, more important than raw performance. Has that changed since we first started talking about this and does it vary just by the end market? I think when a lot of these chips were being done initially, they were being used by the government. But now as they start going into more commercial applications, things are changing, right? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, if we were to talk about edge AI two, three, four years ago, back then, uh, there was not much of an edge AI. In fact, most of the inferencing is done for data centers or supercomputers, or you know, in your case, government applications like you talk about, which is also generally large scale computing. Those are usually just extremely performance focused and you know, cost, power, form factors. You know, those are not um, primary issues, but in edge AI, it's extremely different. And um, for us too, when we were initially uh, planning out this product, we were targeting something that is, you know, 75 watts TDP, uh, because that's, you know, where the market was at the time. But then we took a step back and go, you know, we want this to fit into the power cost size form factors of the edge product, you know, years later. Um, and uh, that's when we decided to actually uh, cut down the inference chip by a pretty substantial size by about, by about a factor of four, just so we can um, play in a much lower cost, lower power, smaller form factor edge market. One of the drivers here has been, everybody thought that a lot of the inferencing would be done in d data centers at, when this first came out. It's We've now got too much data to move around. So now this stuff is moving out to the edge but it's also specialized because you think about a lot of the uh, algorithms, you get much better performance if you can really hone into that, that algorithm. What happens with your inferencing chip? How did you approach this problem? Yeah, we approach that problem still by getting the most efficient computation, just like a specialized hardware, but having the programmability at compile time. So uh, we realized I still just, the very, very beginning of the AI model development um, in terms of time scale, right? We think this is here to stay for decades and decades. And um, it was it would just not be possible for us to have a one size fit all solution that's super specialized for some customer model. Because the fact is, even if we do that today, by the time the chip is in the customer's hands two years later, model would have been different. The, the requirement would have changed substantially. So I think programmability is a key. And I think you touched on a very good point about originally people were just uh, relying on data center inferencing because A, that's all they had at the time. And B, um, you know, there's this whole buzz around 5G, right? Though so 5G is still here and finally it's arriving. Uh, but it's becoming very clear that it's just impossible to send raw data to the cloud to be processed at all times. There has to be a certain amount of intelligence that will iron out 99.9% .9 of the scenarios and maybe, maybe use data center for the extreme cases where, you know, there is, you know, in the simplistic example of a security camera, right? The the edge AI chip got to be able to be able to figure out if there are any suspicious activity happening, if there are any people, you know, that will iron out most, most of the problem. And then in cases there is something interesting then maybe, you know, those portions, which is gonna be a tiny fraction of the overall inference time can be sent, you know, to data centers to be processed even further. Because like you and I talked about, you know, edge, edge inference AI is generally uh, 
meant to satisfy a lot of constraints. And sometimes if you want to run extremely large and sophisticated models, it's just not possible. But you only have to run extremely large and sophisticated models on a very small portion of the data. So let's drill down into this. Sure. So Cheng, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is our uh, Infrax X1, Edge Inference Accelerator. The whole thing is 54 millimeter squares in 16 nanometer, not in not a super advanced process like seven or five nanometer. And it's still not a very big footprint. And um, you see it doesn't have a whole lot of this, whole lot of sophisticated uh, stuff apart from the core meat of it, which is a reconfigurable tensor processor, which is our inference engine which connects to a NOC, which is a network on a chip, then that just goes to a single LPDDR4, 4X uh, DRAM. This is just 32 bit, the smallest they got. And uh, just four lengths of PCI Express. Um, you know, this is not a very large silicon and it's intentional um, because we want it to be, um, you know, fit into a uh, small form factor also a low power reduction, 7 to 13 watts or you know, worst case TDP, a typical power is much lower than that. So you see, it, this is a pretty simple device. Has this idea changed since you started work on this? So you've been working on this, what, a couple of years? Yeah, we started about two years ago uh, when we started designing this product. Originally, we're going to go with something that is four times the size in terms of the reconfigurable tensor processor throughput. Um, and you know, with more length of PCIe, with more LPDDR interfaces, and then we decided, well, you know, yes, the PCIe flop can dissipate 75 watts TTP, but a lot of edge inference customers are not going to be in servers and you know, be able to afford this amount of power. They may not need all that throughput, but they don't want the power and the cost, right? Not just the silicon cost, right? When there's more memory, it's more PCIe, the packaging cost, the system cost all goes up. So, you know, there's a lot of customers that may not want that. So, um, so we decided to take a step back and say, you know, instead of building something that is larger and then just waste the, the resources for customers that don't need it, why don't we build something that's smaller and then for customers that really need more performance, we can put multiple devices on the chip to get more uh, multiple devices on the card. Um, and of course, multiple cards in the system to get more performance that way. So that's how we ended up with the X1. We were originally doing something called the X4, which is four times the size. One of the issues that a lot of people run into is they get this great inferencing chip or they think it's great and then they put it on a board and it doesn't behave the way they want it to. What sort of problems do you see? Yeah, so um, that's why you will actually see, in addition to just the silicon you see here, we are actually offering our PCI Express card at the same time, because that will address a lot of these concerns that you know you are seeing that customers are facing. Right, the chip may not behave as it should, or they don't really know how to program it. So having a ref having a PCIe card a serves as a reference design for those that want to build their own, and b allow the customers to plug into any PCIe servers and just start running them, right? So this solves a lot of their concerns about software integration, about you know how ready is a compiler, how ready is your driver, how reliably does it run in my you know in my system, let it be a Linux system, or or maybe a, you know like a, like x86 or ARM or maybe a, even a Windows system, right? There's all those questions. Um, that can be answered by just having a plug-in card. And that's why we offer in both silicon as well as the accelerator card at the same time. So then when the customer do have to design their own board when they buy our silicon, because you know they have different form factor they got integrated into, they got something that they can compare against and you know it will make their life a lot easier. What's the, the real challenge that you face here? Is it moving data through? Is it delivering power to the entire chip? Um, is it uh, taking advantage of the algorithm and, and, and tightly uh, co-developing the hardware and software? Where are you finding the, the real challenges? I think the last thing that you mentioned is 
the most important thing. First of all, this chip is not a high power device. Our grid is, our power grid is very good. Power delivery is not a problem. We're not trying to burn, you know, 3,000 watts like some of these wafer scale processors, right? Or 15,000 watts for that matter. Um, and also, you know, um, if we take a look at our software flow, you will see that, you know, the interface is to and from the host. Once the chip is initialized, it's extremely simple. We're, we simply load the initial data frame. And when the inference is ready, the output is captured by the host um, to be processed, displayed, or stored. There is not much interface uh, to and from the host during the entire duration of the inferencing. The interface to the LPDDR that you see here is for a dedicated LPDDR that's, that's going to be on the board. So, you know, that doesn't go through the host, that's its own LPDDR. And most of the model at compile time is used um, to use its local memory or the scratch pad memory or this LPDDR. So the, really the, um, the most uh, difficult problem we try to solve, especially now post silicon, uh, is in the compiler. How do you get the compiler to take the most advantage of the tensor processors that we have? And how do we allocate the memory, allocate the resources for both compute and memory and also um, uh, what we call the, the FPGA fabric logic, we call it soft logic. How do we allocate all those resources so that computation is done most efficiently and with the lowest amount of power? Lowest amount of power generally translates into avoiding DRAM whenever possible, and also trying to keep the max active as much as possible during the period of computation. There's a lot of techniques that goes into there all in the compilers that's hidden from the user. But those are the things we spend a lot of effort on. So one of the problems with developing anything in AI has always been that you, you've got obsolescence very quickly. You've got algorithms that change almost on a regular basis and actually system design, uh, design changes as well. And then on top of that, some of these chips have to be in the market for longer. How do you deal with that? Yeah, extremely good question, Ed. Um, that's why we are firm believers that flexibility in AI is the utmost important thing. More important than performance, power, or anything is you have to be able to adapt to the customer models, changing models over time, instead of optimizing it for whatever you think is gonna be the model at design time. Because let's face it, by the time it's in customer's hands two years later, it will not be the same model anymore. We guarantee it and we see it time and time again. So that's why compiler is extremely important. And that's why um, in our case, our computational units, which we call the uh, tensor processing units, are not hardwired to anything. They are configured by our compiler to get data from certain memory, uh, do their processing, and write output to certain memory. And how many um, of these units we execute in, in, in parallel, versus chaining them in series is all decided at compile time. It's based on the, the, the operation, the, the layer is, um, the layer of neural network model is trying to execute. And once a certain layer finishes, um, the chip is actually able to rewire itself um, to perform the next layer. You will see this time and time again, as sometimes people try to fit all the layers into a piece of silicon at the same time, it becomes extremely problematic because no large how big your because no matter how large your silicon is, you will not be able to anticipate the size of the models to come. That's why our reconfigurable fabric is actually runtime reconfigurable. It's it it's of course compiled at compile time, but in the binaries is generated at compile time. But at runtime, uh a layer or a set of layer for the model will execute and then a time of reconfiguration will happen. And then the next set of layers will execute. As you can see, when the next set of layer is executed, the wiring of the, the computational units can be different. Because the next layer may need to have more computations daisy chaining series and have a lower degree of parallelism as a result of that. You know, all those things are, are are again decided at compile time, but reconfigured and executed at runtime. 
and you see that we have an overhead of a few microseconds, but generally, you know, we are executing each layer for on the order of milliseconds. So we're looking at a fraction of a percent of overhead. And that's something we're willing to pay to get extremely high efficiency, ASIC-like performance once the configuration is done. Because then it looks just like a hardwired logic. If you reconfigure this for um, whatever the algorithm changes are, is that a difficult process? Can you do that? Or is it pretty much once uh, you've done it, it's fixed? Um, so basically, every time the customer changes the model, uh, they need to be recompiled. The binary is regenerated. And once it's generated, you can run it for as many times as you like. So at runtime, there is no penalty of reconfiguration other than the microseconds that you see here. But at compile time, it's just like compiling code. Every time we change our C++ code, we need to recompile it, get a new executable. The executable is then running on, in this case, the x86. Here, you know, same thing. When every time the model changes because the customer either changed their weight or they have a new graph, the model has to be compiled. And then each layer is then uh, compiled into binaries, which is then loaded um, by our driver. So that at runtime, you know, the model just runs through different binaries one after another. And at the end of that, the model is finished. As you're working with these chips, what sort of problems do you have to keep in mind? What are the challenges that uh, engineers have to, to deal with and what do they typically get wrong? Yeah, well, um, this is a silicon that has talked through the uh, PCI Express interface to the host, as well as an LPDDR interface um, to talk to a dedicated DRAM, like I should show you right here. So uh, this is um, our PCI Express card that we have built, um, uh, that we have uh, built to serve as a reference for the customer, as well as a uh, PCIe inference card that they can outright purchase. Um, so uh, there is four lengths of PCI Express here, but actually that's not the most challenging part. I think most people will tell you that the 32 single-ended signals of four gigabit per second LPDDR is probably the most challenging part of the design. And to get that right, you know, um, basically they either have to have a reference that they can look at or they have to go and hire somebody that's done this before. Um, so being able to provide this to a customer is extremely valuable because they can see that the chip works. It works in a system. It works through the entire software flow because they can run stuff on it right away. And also um, when it, it comes time for the chip customers to integrate this chip into their own silicon, they have a very good working example that they can refer to. So that's extremely valuable to many. Cheng Wang, as always, thanks for a great explanation. Of course. Thank you very much, Ed.